tell you a little story. My son today, he came into the house, and what was he saying? Praise the Lord. God blesses his children and gives them salamanders. <laughs> so he writes songs. It's wonderful. You hear me when I call You are my morning song Though darkness fills the night It cannot hide the light Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though troubles linger still whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. strength is in your name for you alone can save you will deliver me yours is a victory whom shall I fear whom shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God Angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Nothing formed against me shall stand. that is comforting because you do tell us in your word that you give your angels charge over things concerning us we thank you father that you're an ever-present help that you never leave us nor forsake us that you remain with us and you'll never lord depart from us your presence lord it it's just there and it strengthens us and lord for those things tonight we thank you we want to pray, Lord, for those in our fellowship as we start our service and are here this evening. And some, Lord, are just dealing with the head cold kind of a thing that's going around and some things more serious. And certainly we want to pray for Ken Werner as he's recuperating tonight at home. We thank you that he is home and it wasn't a heart attack, but it was, you know, it was pneumonia. It was still serious. And Lord, we thank you that the pain has resided and that he is doing well. And we want to continue to pray for destiny and just as he's facing the 
surgery, Lord, for the breast cancer, Lord, that you would just take away any concern or any fear and that you'd guide the surgeon's hand. We thank you that he's a believer and already been praying. So God, you're good. We want to pray for Susan tonight and just the difficulty she's having with her physical body and many others, Lord. But as we gather here tonight in your presence, we want to pray for them. We pray for them in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids would say, amen. Hey, go ahead and be seated this evening. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? His love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in our wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you will take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King of love all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me And worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Amazing grace, this is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for. All that you've done for me.
with our eyes is not the reality of everything that's going on. We know that there's a war raging around us. And yet, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we can see the God of angel armies. Tonight, Lord, as we focus upon your face, that we would be able to find peace in you and rest and comfort fall at your feet and worship
worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on.
How true each word of that song is. It's a very special song to me. I had that song at my father's funeral. Because I had the wonderful opportunity of introducing my earthly father to my heavenly father. And I wanted my dad to know that he has a father and he's with him. And Lord, we thank you for those moments where you just minister to us, Lord. And, and that song still rings true to me all these years later. It rings true to each one of us because we do have a father that knows our name. He knows everything there is to know about us. He knows every thought, every difficulty. He sees every tear. He hears every prayer. Oh, Father, we thank you for that, for your unfailing love and your constant presence and encouragement. We thank you for that tonight. And Lord, we just pray for those, you know, in our fellowship that are struggling, Lord, those that are going through a difficulty, those that are experiencing health issues, Lord, we lift them before you. And again, Lord, we want to pray for Ken Warner and Destiny and Susan Stubblefield and those that are going through some more serious difficulties, Lord, just we ask that you would bless them and heal them, Father. And so, Lord, we just lift these needs before you tonight. And oh, how we have felt your presence here this evening. Thank you, Lord. And all God's kids would say, Amen. 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 Well, take a few moments and greet one another before you settle into your seat. I was going to announce it um, tonight. There's several things I want to make announcements. That's one of them for special prayer. I, she couldn't even, if she's a nurse, get into. Okay, if we can settle into our spots this evening, we'll get moving. So if you can find your place. Oh, Rhonda is here. We were, I was just about to make an announcement that you should be praying for Rhonda, but she just walked in the back door. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the announcement as much as I know. There's several announcements I want to make, and they're really prayer requests that not something we just pray for while we're here tonight, but something we need to continue to be praying for. Rhonda's son was in a severe motorcycle accident, and um, it was a head-on with a car, a hit-and-run, and it's, uh, it's severe, and he's in ICU in Marysville, correct? Roseville. Trauma unit. So we just need to be praying for him. He's, he's not a believer, but we need to pray that, you know, that first of all, the Lord would spare his life, heal his physical body, and that this would be the wake-up call that he needs to give his life to Christ. Amen. Sometimes God does that. I want to pray for that. Uh, secondly, we, we do, you, some of you have been asking why we haven't been announcing anything about um, Pastor Doug and Destiny, Destiny's surgery. Um, I just want you to know and just continue to pray that the CAT scan and the MRI came back clean. The test for the, her being a genetic carrier of breast uh, cancer came back negative, And so they have tentatively scheduled the surgery for April the 13th. And so just be praying that, you know, our family could get through that. It's been tough, man, I'm going to tell you. So those two things, just continue to pray for those. And tonight, we move back to our studies in the Old Testament. We have finished. In fact, if you're here tonight and your name wasn't on the list yet, we've already ordered the certificates, uh, the blanks that we could print your names and all of the uh, stuff on for your completing the doctor's class. So make sure that you're signed up. I think there was... 60 of you guys that actually completed it, 115 started it, and most of you went through most of it, but you had to have gone through all of it to put your name to get a certificate, and when you finish, the rest of it will still give you a certificate, just let us know, but make sure you put your name on the list so we can get you printed out. I think this coming Sunday, we're going to um, hand those things out in front of the whole church. I, I think it's remarkable that 115 people, and we averaged 80, 90 people going through the class. And that 60 of you signed up and said, I completed it. A doctor's class. That's amazing. Yes, it is. So we'll be handing those certificates out. Hey, let's turn in our Bibles tonight to Exodus chapter 21. That's where we left off. You know that we finished up the doctrines class the last few studies on Wednesday night. So we set aside our Old Testament study, but now we're back on track. And a very interesting study it is. So as you're turning to Exodus chapter 21, let's just bow our heads again and pray for God's word. Father, we thank you that we have your word before us and that we don't have to wonder or figure it out on our own what it is that you desire of us and how we are to walk before you in a way that's pleasing to you. But you just tell us right here in your word what it is. And so tonight as we open up and we begin to study civil law, and oh Father, if our nation and the world would only follow what you have prescribed in your word for civil government, this place would be a much safer place, I believe. So Lord, just give us insight tonight, we pray, as we go through these things we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you'll remember, and you do have to remember back a little ways, uh, when we left off our studies in Exodus to complete our doctrinal study, that we had finished chapter 20. And when you come to chapter 20 of Exodus, you have what is known in the Scripture as the moral law, the Ten Commandments. The first four have to do with our relationship with God. The other six have to do with our relationship with each other. But when he finishes off giving the moral law, and by the way, the moral law is still in effect. You need to understand things. Some people will say, well, I'm no longer under the law. And I want to clarify tonight that that doesn't mean you're not still under the moral law. God still does not want you to murder, to lie, to commit adultery. He doesn't want you to have any other gods before you. All of those things are still in place. It's the ceremonial law that you had to go through to be righteous you're no longer under because your righteousness comes to you by grace. There's no more need for a sacrifice and those things because Christ is the sacrifice. In fact, Christ said he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. And in Christ, we can fulfill the law. You know, we can walk in a, before our God in a way that's pleasing to him and we can interact with each other. In fact, 
when they asked Jesus the question, which is the greatest of the commandments, you remember what he said, that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That contains the first four commandments in the 10. And then he said, the second cannot be separated from the first, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. And that takes in the next six. And then he said, in this commandment, all of the law is fulfilled. So the moral law, as we looked at it when we left off, is still intact. We still should obey that, not for a means of salvation, but from a position of salvation, we want to be obedient, correct? Now we move into civil law. And this is interesting. Next three chapters are going to be fun. Because one of the things, as far as institutions that God has created, He created marriage as an institution, but He also created civil government to govern society in a way to bring order. And it's interesting that He didn't leave us to figure it out on our own, but He spent three chapters, chapter 21, chapter 22, and chapter 23 of Exodus, deal with the judgments as God is going to set in order these judges to judge in civil matters. Now, you remember when Moses was hearing every case, and his father-in-law came to him and said, this is not wise, Moses, you're going to wear yourself out. Here's what you need to do with these people. Because, listen, when you get a crowd of people, you always have trouble. Did you know that? In fact, so much trouble at one point, Moses said, these aren't my people. I didn't begat them. I'm sick of all of the committees and the complaints. And, you know, listen. And so his father-in-law came to him and said, listen, you divide them up in ranks. You put men as captains or judges over 50, over 100, over 1,000. And listen, the serious complaints you will hear, but let them deal with the rest. And then God wrote down through Moses the judgments, and that's what we have in chapter 21, 22, and 23. And listen, our laws originally with the founding fathers, if you know anything about the, 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 the founding of this country, were founded, judicially speaking, on these principles. Now, as we go through those, I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. We're going to see that a lot of those things, as we've set them aside as we thought ourselves to be wiser than God and how we interact with each other and the punishments that are enacted upon certain crimes, as we've set those things aside, the effect morally that it's had on our culture and our, on our society. Some of these commandments or judgments as they are, these laws that are to govern society and to keep civil order, some of them are very severe. But if they were in place, they wouldn't have to be enacted near as often because you would know that this is the penalty for that kind of behavior. And it, in those days, it was done publicly, it was done quickly, it was done severely, and not only did the person reap the benefit of what they had done, but it was a learning experience for everybody else around them. In fact, even in the New Testament, it says that if a person sins, rebuke them openly that others may fear. We don't do that anymore because if we did that, there wouldn't be anybody in the church to rebuke. Everybody would leave and go to a church that doesn't rebuke. But God wants order. He's a God of order. In fact, if I could say this tonight, God would rather have you under tyranny than in a situation of anarchy. Because even under a tyrannical government, there is order, and you may suffer, but listen, you will learn to be under authority. But without any authority, there's anarchy, and God hates that because that is rebellion. And so he wrote these statutes down for us and said, this should govern your society. This should govern civilization. This should gov these are the judgments by which your rulers shall govern you as far as civil matters go. And there's three chapters of it. And so let's dive in. And the very first section in chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, are, are <laughs> commandments on slavery. Now, how many heard recently that one of the mocking ways that our president mocked the Scriptures is because he mentioned slavery? How many heard that? Well, the minute he started mocking slavery, he, it, it, it was very clear to me he did not understand the Scriptures. Now, listen. Go back to chapter 20, verse 1. Let's read this. Here's what it says. 
And God spake all of these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. I delivered you from slavery. And the first 11 verses that deal with slavery limit it. And he ministers grace in it. And you won't find anywhere in these precepts any justification for going and enslaving another group of people. In fact, every one of these, you have to put yourself in that position of servanthood. And we're going to see tonight there were four reasons or four ways by which you could become a slave in the Hebraic society. And none of them were by force. In other words, when you read what he has before us concerning slavery, there is a prohibition by going and conquering another people and making them indentured servants to you. He's saying you don't do that. But what you, do, you can do if somebody becomes your servant, and there's four reasons and ways they can do that, then this is how you have to treat them. And they can't be your servant forever. They, we're going to see tonight. They can only be your servant for six years. In the seventh year, you've got to get, let them go free. And you can't kill them and you can't abuse them like in the same time. In fact, when Jesus came, we, historians tell us there were over six million slaves in the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, if you had a slave and they displeased you in any way, there was one case in ancient writing where a servant had dropped a pitcher off the tray, and when it hit the ground, it broke. And right there in front of all of the company, the person who owned that slave had him put to death. Because slaves in the Roman Empire, slaves even at this time in Egypt, were considered to be property. And yet God elevates the slave to be someone who is a person, and they do have rights. And if they become an indentured slave to you, they can only be that for, for six years, and on the seventh you've got to let them go. And there's ways you have to treat them, and if you don't treat them in the ways you should, they should be treated, then the civil government can step in and punish you. So under God's word, slavery was elevated. It wasn't completely removed, but we're going to see tonight why you could become a servant. In fact, let me just give you the four ways you could before we dive into this. In Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39, it says, in extreme cases of poverty. And, you know, if you're an employee tonight, you might have done this. In extreme cases of poverty, you could sell yourself into slavery. You know, if, if your crop failed and your house burned down and your oxen died and you were just having, I mean, a horrible time financially and your neighbor next to you was, you know, being blessed, you could go to him and you could say, listen, I want to sell myself to you because they knew there was a limitation on it. It could only be six years the seventh you had to go free. I want to sell myself to you to be a servant. That means I get to move into your house. I get to eat your food. I will work for you. You'll put a roof over my head and you'll take care of me. I could personally put myself in that position according to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39. Secondly, as we're going to see tonight in Exodus chapter 21, verse 7, your father, listen children, your father, good thing the youth group went up into the youth class, your father could sell you. So let's say that you're struggling here and you have, in those days, you would have a lot of children. Maybe you had 12, 13 children and you're struggling and you need some more income and your neighbor needs some servants, some farmhands. You could go to your neighbor and say, pick out two or three of them. And you could sell them and it, to be a somebody else's servant. Now, you knew that you could do that only for six years and the seventh year they go free. So on their 13th birthday, you talk to your neighbor. And you get them back when they're 21. But you could do that. The father, we're going to see, in fact, the father, he could even make arrangements to sell his daughters to be betrothed to a neighbor for income. So that was the second way you could become a servant. The third way we find in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, in cases of bankruptcy. Let's say that you borrowed a lot of money and now your investment collapsed and you filed bankruptcy. In those days, it didn't relieve you from the debt. 
and you may have to sell yourself for the next six or seven years to the servanthood of the person who loaned you the money to pay back the debt. And so you could do it in cases of bankruptcy. And the last case, in Exodus chapter 22, we won't get there tonight, but in chap- at verse 3 through 4, if you were a thief and you broke in and you stole something and you took it or you slaughtered it, you ate it or you sold it, and then you were found out and you had no, nothing with which to repay or make restitution, then you could be sold into slavery to the person that you stole from until the debt was paid. But those, as we look at the Scripture, are the only four reasons why you could become a servant or a slave. And then, in the first 11 verses of chapter 21 of Exodus, it tells us that there are limitations to that. So let's just dive into our study. Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. In other words, God is saying to Moses, these are the judgments. This is how you're going to organize your civil government. These will be the rules and regulations that you will give to your judges that they can use to judge in the civil matters between people and between the things that might go on that need to be judged. If thou buy a Hebrew servant. So within God's people, if under one of these four reasons, someone finds himself as an indentured servant to you. Here's what he says. Six years he shall serve you, and in the seventh year he shall go out free for nothing. He can't be a servant forever. He is not property. If you buy him or whatever reason he becomes an indentured servant of yours, he only can be that for this amount of years. Won't be for his lifetime. It'll only be for seven years. Then he gets to go free owing you nothing. So, you know, whatever the debt was would have to be settled. Verse 3, if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. So if they came in together, if his master have given him a wife, now while he was there, while he sold himself into the master's hand to be a servant, and the master gave him a wife, and she have borne him sons and daughters. The wife and her children shall be the masters, and he shall go out by himself. Now, there's a way to redeem them. Don't think, but he has to pay the dowry and all of that. I mean, because they are the masters. He provided the wife and the offspring, because he provided the wife, the shelter and all of that, remained his. And it was still under the sense of servanthood, but he could redeem them. But he goes out by himself. So, you know, I I wonder how many servants said, this is my way out. Man, I'm gone. (laughs) So, you know, the wife must have had to really pay attention on that seventh year. Let's have a little fun with this. Come on, guys. (laughs) And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master. I love my wife. I love my children. I will not go out free. Then the master shall bring him unto the judges. These are the people that are are magistrates that are set over civil government. He'll bring them to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door. It's interesting. A lot of things take place in doorways. You know, at the gates of the city. In fact, later as the culture and as the civilization is being established in every major city within the walls as you entered the gate were the courtrooms established. That's where they were built. And if you had a case that you need tried, you would go to the gates of the city. In fact, a lot of archaeologists have unearthed these things and found these rooms and wondered what they were right at the gates of the city. Well, that's where the courts were convened. You remember the scripture says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church? Most people think that that means we have to storm the gates, we're in a battle. That's not at all what it's saying. The gates are the places where people were tried. It's the place where the court was convened. And what the Scripture is saying, that the gates of hell and every accusation of the wicked one will not prevail over you on that day when you stand before God in His court. Because God has already declared you to be clean and free. The gates of hell will not prevail in court against you. So you would bring the servant to the doorpost of your house with the magistrates there or the judges with you. 
And then the master shall also bring, it says, bring him unto the door and the doorpost, and the master shall bore his ear through with an awl. Now, any of you, you, all you guys know what an awl is. It's a pointed object. So you're going to stick his ear on the doorpost, and you're going to poke it through. You're going to pierce it. Now, some of you came to me when Ben, our worship leader, my son-in-law, pierced his ears. Some of you legalists came to me and said, is that okay in the Scripture? I said, absolutely. I'll give you chapter and verse. In fact, every one of your wives should have a pierced ear. Because what it says is I am willing to be your servant. And I will bear the mark of a servant the piercing of my ear. And so they would take him and pierce his ear, and he shall serve him, how long? Forever. This was called a love slave. In the New Testament, the Greek word is doulo or doulos. And isn't it interesting that Peter and Paul and Jude and John, when they write their epistles, they reference themselves as what? The doulos of Jesus Christ, the servant. One, by an act of their will, has allowed the Lord to put that mark in them of servanthood, and forever they will serve him. And so there was that you could do, and you would go and you would get the earring, it would bear the mark of the servant. And then it says in verse 7, and if the man sells his daughter, now here's another way. If a man sells his daughter to be the maidservant, and she, and she shall not go out as the maidservants do, if she pleases not her master, who hath betrothed her, or himself or to his son, he's going to say in a few moments, that he's betrothed them to, he shall let her go redeemed to sell her Unto a stranger, he can't do that. So here's the indication. If you sell your daughter, if a guy comes to you and says, man, your, your, your daughter is everything that I want for myself, a young man. Or if a father comes to you and says, your daughter is everything I want for a daughter-in-law, I want to buy her for my son. There was a dowry that needed to be paid. And you could do that. And the dowry would be paid, and you could sell your daughter. Now, if she went there and the son says, man, I'm not marrying her, really? Are you kidding, Dad? You couldn't do better than that. No way. Or if he didn't want to take her to be a wife, then he, they did not have the right to sell her to a stranger. But watch this. This is interesting. So, if she please not, verse 8, her master who hath betrothed her to himself, then, she, then he shall let her... Let her be redeemed, that means they can buy her back. To sell her unto a stranger, he shall not have the power, seeing he had dealt deceitfully with her. Now she went somewhat willing, they received the dowry, the deal was struck. And if she hath betrothed her unto his son, if he's betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her according to the matter of, manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, so if the son says, I don't want her, give me a different one, her food, her raiment, her duty of marriage shall not be diminished. He still has to pay the dowry. He still has to support her. He still has to take care of her. And if she do not... These things, these three things for her, then she shall go out free without money. The dowry's already been paid to the father. She can return to the father. He's already received the money. She doesn't get anything, but the father has the means to take care of the daughter that was rejected. And now can you imagine what you're going to have to do with a daughter that's rejected? You better have some money. Send her on her vacation. Do something. You know, appease that. But that is if you you know, sell your daughter, you know, to somebody to be. And then it says this in verse 12. Now, now we enter into capital punishment. Now, I, I know that some of you, you, you know, I don't know if you're a Democrat or Republican. I don't know if you're a libertarian. I don't know what your position is politically. And I really don't care. I want to tell you what the Word of God says. Amen? Because some of you might say tonight, well, I don't believe in capital punishment. Well, I'm going to tell you what God's Word says. Watch this. So those are 
the commandments dealing with servanthood. If somebody sells himself into, uh, to become an indentured servant, those are the four reasons. That's how they have to be treated. Now we move into verse 12, and it says this. He that smiteth a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. Back in Genesis chapter 9, you can read it when you go home, verse 6, it says, If you shed another man's blood so that he dies, your blood shall be shed as well. A life for a life, you have forfeited your life, if it's murder. Now, as we go through this, he's going to make a difference between premeditation, manslaughter. All of those laws that we have that govern our land come from the Scripture. That's where capital punishment comes from. Now, the cry currently today in our civilization and in our culture is, well, who gave the state the right to put somebody to death? Aren't they doing the same thing? No, they are not. Go to Romans chapter 13 and read there carefully that as God has ordained civil government, He has placed those people, those judges, in a position of authority to the extent that they do not, the Bible says, wield the sword in vain. If you do wrong, you had better fear them. If you do good, you have nothing to fear. But God has placed within their hands the right and the authority to execute His laws, which means that the state and the federal government, if you murder somebody, has the right to track you down and arrest you. And they have the right to try you, and if you are found guilty of premeditated murder, that you have killed somebody, then they not only have the responsibility and the right, but they have the edict under God to put you to death. Your blood has been forfeited because you killed somebody. You are bearing, really, the consequence of your actions, and the government is in a position, the civil government, to exercise that. That's what it's saying in Romans chapter 13. So, here he says, very carefully, listen to me, Verse 12, he that smiteth a man, he that strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. That's, the idea is premeditated because watch the construct of the rest of the scripture. Verse 13, and if a man lie not in wait, so it's not premeditated. You know, there are situations where you may take somebody's life, but it's not premeditated. It's, we call it today in our society a crime of passion. Let's say, God forbid, you walked home and you found your wife with, a, with another man. Or you went in and found your husband with another woman, and at that moment you snapped. And you took your spouse out. Now, you're going to be tried under some punishments that's going to come, but it's not premeditated. They, it doesn't qualify as murder. Now, it is manslaughter. You did kill somebody, but it wasn't premeditated. This is what he's saying. Watch verse 13. And if a man lie not in wait, but God delivereth him into his hand. There's two things going on here. Either it could be manslaughter or non-premeditated. So let's say that you come over to my house to help me, um, I don't know, put a beam up that I'm going to put a new garage. It's interesting that Bubba, when he, <laughs> we, were doing, we were building this building between the two buildings, uh, Amy's husband, man, he's big. Yeah. Well, that's why he's called Bubba. And we had him putting up all the beams. He'd put them up there, and we'd nail them in. He'd put them up there. Now, what happened if one of those beams fell on Bubba and killed him? You know, maybe, you know, I had some negligence in that. That's manslaughter. Now, they got to try me and see if it was negligent, if I it wasn't premeditated and all of that. But it's not the same crime. It was an accident. We call it an act of God. Or if you snap, you're going to see in a few moments, it's not premeditated. Different rules apply. Watch this. And if a man lay not in wait, but God delivereth him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whether he may flee. So there's a city so that, you know, someone doesn't come and get you and put you to death because you did kill somebody. There there are going to be cities that I will designate that you can run to and you can stay there and you'll be safe. It's ole ole action free until until the trial. Now watch this, verse 14. But if a man comes presumptuously, it's willfully, upon his neighbor to slay him with guile. That means there's an intent, there's anger, there's, there, there's guile behind it. Thou shalt take that person from mine altar, even if he's in that city, and he shall die. And he that smiteth his father or his mother 
shall surely be put to death. And again, it's the idea um, that you've killed your father and mother. It doesn't matter if it even happens within a family. If you take their life, you are to be put to death. In a few moments, we're going to talk about striking them. There's other punishments. In fact, under the Old Testament law, if you struck your parent and your neighbors saw it, they could arrest you and take you to the elders of the city. And they would stone you to death. You see, back in those days, teenagers did get stoned. But they got stoned in a whole different way. But it was an example. Now, that seems harsh, doesn't it? But what is one of the things that the Bible says in the last days, or will earmark the last days, that children would be disobedient to their parents? Because I will tell you, if we, if, we, if, if we had that happen in our society, and all of a sudden, you know, on your TV set, you know, how that emergency broadcast thing comes on, and it would, you know, beep, and this is, nothing's wrong with your set, this is a, you know, a test of the emergency broadcasting, and by the way, we're going to be having a public stoning of a teenager this Thursday night, you know, down in the middle of town, everybody show up. And if you brought your teenagers right down to the town with you, and, and the elder said, this teenager struck their parent. They revolted and rebelled and struck their parent. We've tried the case. We found it to be true. And now the elders of the city are going to stone this one to death. And all the other teenagers are standing around watching this. I tell you what, I think rebellion would be greatly diminished. Or there would be a lot less teenagers in that community. Because God hates rebellion, and God has put people in authority. We're going to see, as we, before we get through all of these judgments, that he's talking, you're not supposed to speak against those people that are in authority. Whether it be the people that are over you spiritually, like the priests, or whether it be the judges, or whether it be those in civil government, those people are to be honored and respected because God hates rebellion. So, if they strike their father and mother under the Old Testament law, aren't you glad we're not under the Old Testament? I don't know. We might, it might it'd be a lot different, wouldn't it? They also are to be put to death. Now watch this as we go on. Now verse 16. And he that stealeth a man, that's called kidnapping, and selleth him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. So there are several things that, that, that will garner capital punishment. If you premeditatedly slay somebody, if you slay somebody with premeditation, you've planned it. It's not, a, it's not an accident, it's not manslaughter, or it's not a crime of passion, but it's premeditated. If you've shed somebody's life, your life is forfeited. If you rebel against your parent and strike them, even though it's your parent, some indications in the Scripture, if you just strike them, even if they don't die, you get put to death. That was the severe interpretation of the law. But if you struck them and they died, you were put to death, even though it was your parent. If you were caught kidnapping somebody, then you were put to death. That was a capital crime. Verse 17, and he that curseth his father, here we go, and his mother shall surely be put to death. So if you strike them, do they die? Or if you curse them? So now we have another. Hey, next Thursday, meet back here again. We got another case. This one has been cursing their father and mother. So we're going to see some teenagers get stoned downtown tonight. Verse 18. And if a man strive together one with another with a stone or with his fist, and he die not, but he keepeth his bed, if he rises again and walks abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be acquitted, only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. If you get in a fight with somebody and you injure the other person, whether you pick up a rock and smack him or punch him with his fist, so that he is unable to work. You break his leg, you break his arm, you know, you blacking his eye where he can't see, and he's unable to work. If they judge the case and find you to be responsible for that, then you have to pay his medical expenses and his lost wages if he doesn't die, if he gets up and recovers. If he rises again and walks abroad, then it's okay. You just pay those things. And if a man smites his servant, now we're coming to servants, and, and, the, and the rights that servants had 
as they were you know, in servitude to their masters, if a man smites his servant or his maid with a rod and he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. He's murdered the person. Notwithstanding, if he continues a day or two, and the idea, the intent was not to murder. If he lives a few days, you, you, you didn't mean to. It wasn't premeditated. You didn't try to kill him, but you, you, you got out of hand, and maybe you beat, beat your servant too much. But he lives three or four days, so you understand the intent was not to kill. He shall not be punished, for he is his money. The loss of the, in a few moments we're going to see that that servant would have got to go free, but the loss of that is enough punishment is the idea. Now watch this in verse 22. If a man strives and hurts a woman with child. So you get in a scuffle. And while you're in the scuffle, you knock over this, this lady who's pregnant. And because of her injury, she delivers her baby prematurely. This is the idea. Watch this. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit departs from her, she gives premature birth, and yet no mischief follows. The baby doesn't die or she doesn't die. It's just a premature birth, and there's some difficulties with it. He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges have determined. You're going to pay restitution for that. And if mischief follows, if the baby dies or if the mother dies, then he shall give his life. Now, here it is. Watch this. This is important. Because so many have said that the law was so stringent, so harsh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You have to understand that the law was given to this degree to keep people from going beyond that. Because the death, the the, the heart of man is desperately wicked. You think for a moment. You get in a fight and somebody punches your eye, you want to kill them. See, the law under the Old Testament restricted how much you could punish somebody. Now watch this. Here's what it says in verse, 23, uh, verse 24. Eye for an eye. You can't go beyond that. It doesn't mean you have to take an eye for an eye. It doesn't mean you can't forgive. But that's the boundary. If somebody pokes your eye out, you can't kill them. You can't go beyond the bound. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. It restricted the level of restitution that you could draw out of somebody for your injury. It was limiting it. Verse 26, and if a man smite the eye of his servant. Now he's got somebody there that's his servant. Or the eye of his maid, that is maid servant, that it perish. He puts their eye out. He shall let them go free for the eye's sake. They get their freedom. If he smites his manservant's tooth or maidservant's tooth, that means to knock it out, he shall let him go free for the tooth's sake. That's the cost. If he hits you, see, servants, indentured slaves had rights. You strike them in the eye, put their eye, they could go free. You knock their tooth out. Now, don't you think some of the servants thought, well, I'll sell myself into servants. I'll get the money for being sold as a slave. I'll incite the the owner, maybe he's a little hot-tempered. I'll stick my face, let him knock a tooth out, and then I get to go free. Somebody probably thought of that, but th that's the, the deal here. If he knocks your tooth out, you get to go free. Now watch this. Now here comes the laws of negligence. So we've looked at the laws of servants, the laws of capital punishment, the laws of retribution for how we treat one another. Now we come, as we come to verse 28, you know, laws that pertain to your neglect of things, and you cause injury because of your neglect. Watch this. If an ox gores a man or a woman, that they die. So you've got this ox, and hey, you've got him, you know, on a leash, and you're headed to the marketplace. And this thing goes crazy and gores somebody, and they die. Watch this. But if if you have an ox, a man has an ox, or a, uh, and it gores a woman or a man that they die, then the ox shall surely be stoned to death, the idea is, and his flesh shall not be eaten, 
but the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. It's, it's not his fault. He was taking it to the market. He had it on a leash. Something happened beyond his control. That's the idea. And it gored somebody and they died. Now the ox bears the penalty of that. You put the ox to death. It can't be used for meat. It's, it's, this punishment is to die. Let it rot. Don't use it. But the owner will be acquitted. Now listen to verse 29. But if the ox were wont to push with his horns in times past, if you knew this was a troubled ox, if you knew that this ox had the potential to gore, if it had in times past tried to strike other people, if it was uncontrollable, and you knew that, now watch this, and you knew that, but if it were wont to push with its horns in times past, and it had been testified. Someone told you to his owner, and he hath not kept him in. He didn't leave him in a place where he couldn't harm people, not kept him in, and but he hath killed a man or a woman. The ox, watch the end of verse 29, the ox shall be stoned, and the owner also shall be put to death. You were negligent in this. You knew it. So, you know that your brakes are bad in your car. You took it to Brian. He told you the brakes are bad in the car. You should not drive this car. The brakes are out. You were warned. And you get in the car anyway, and you head home, and you come to a stop intersection, and you stomp on the brakes, and it doesn't stop, and you knew that it wasn't going to stop. You were warned that it wasn't going to stop. You run the stop sign, and you hit that person, and you kill them. That is not manslaughter. You were warned. That's what he's saying here. So you, there are the laws of being negligent with the things that you own. You have to be careful about that. Verse 30. If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatever is laid upon him. Now, let's say that I'm on my way to the marketplace. This guy who has this ox who's known to gore, he acts up all the time. He's uncontrollable. He was warned about that. Is going to the same marketplace maybe to sell this ox, and he gores my son, and he kills my son. The ox is to be stoned to death. The man has forfeited his life. But I can say to the courts, listen, I don't want the man to die, but here's what I do want. The man owes me a million dollars for my son. That's what happens in situations today in most fatal accidents. You know, the, 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 generally the price of a life is a million dollars. That you can redeem that person or they can redeem themselves back out of that penalty of death. Because they're not the one who actually did it, but they were neglect in it. So he can be redeemed. Verse 30 says that. Verse 31, whether he hath gored a son or the gored a daughter, according to the judgment, it shall be done unto him. If the ox pushes a man's servant or a man's maidservant, now this is your service, not a son or a daughter or a family member, he shall give unto his master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned to death. The price of a gored servant that died was 30 pieces of silver. Ring a bell? Jesus was a gored servant. And Judas Iscariot sold him for 30 pieces of silver. So that was the price of a gored servant. And Jesus certainly was the servant of God to redeem us. Amen? And if a man shall open a pit, now you're digging holes. Or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or a donkey, I'm going to just say donkey. Old King James has another word for it. I had a guy ask me the other day, when you get to that, you told me to buy an old King James. You always change words. Well, there's some words I'm just not comfortable saying. They mean something different in our culture. But a donkey. And the donkey falls therein. The owner of the pit shall make good and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. So you dig a pit. You're digging. You're, you know, you're putting this big hole in your backyard, maybe to put a new septic tank in or whatever, and you don't cover it up when you're done. 
or you've already dug it and you uncover it and you forget to cover it back up. And the neighbor's donkey gets loose, comes and falls in your pit and dies. Guess what? You just bought a donkey. It's yours. Hopefully you can, I don't know what you would do with a dead donkey, but it's yours. It becomes yours, you pay the guy. Verse 34, the owner of the pit shall make good and give money unto the owner of them, that is the donkeys, and the dead beast shall be his. Verse 35, and if a man's ox hurt another, that he dies. So your, your ox, you're going to the marketplace with your ox. Another guy's going to the marketplace with his ox. His ox acts up and kills yours. I don't, would that be an oxymoron? <laughs> if any man's ox hurts another's that he die, then they shall sell the live ox. Watch this. God has such a good sense of humor. Then they shall sell the live one and divide the money of, and the dead ox shall also be divided. Okay, your ox killed my ox. We sell your ox, we split the money. We're both going to the marketplace, and now we split the dead ox. You get half, I get half. How fair that is. Or if it be known, now here it is, if it be known that that ox hath pushed in times past, it has a tendency to act up, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead ox shall be his own. He's going to have to pay for the guy's ox, and he gets the ox that was killed. Chapter 22, let's go for a few verses. We've got a few moments before we have to wind down. Isn't this stuff just fun? Isn't this what you were so looking forward to study? I just needed to know that. But I will tell you, if you implement these things, our society would be a whole lot different. Amen? These are God's rules for creating a civilization. Now watch this, chapter 22. If a man shall steal an ox or a sheep, and kill it, or sell it, he shall restore five ox for an ox, and four sheep for a sheep. So if you're a thief, and you break in, and you steal something, you don't get to sit in a plush gel, and watch big screen colored TV, and get three hots and a cot. No, what you have to do is go to work. They had in those days what they called credit uh, uh, debtor's prisons. You went to work to earn the money to pay back what you had robbed that man of, and you paid back with interest. And so if you stole one sheep, you paid four. If you stole one ox, you paid five in return. Now watch verse 2, and I wanted to go at least this far tonight because, you know, I, some of you are a little squeamish. Um, you know, our particular sheriff, can I say that? Maybe we, you, know, you know, we're getting ready to put all of our stuff on radio. In fact, I've got the first promo done the, the guy that's producing our radio program for us has done the entry and the exit, and, and he's doing James first. And uh, Pastor Bob Fromm is going to let us have the 2 p.m. slot in his radio station in Yuba City, and then we'll put ourselves on in Gardnerville in Nevada, and maybe even KNCO if they don't want so much. And uh, I say that to say this, that we might edit some of these tapes. So uh, I'm just going to say this, uh, and we can edit it because i got a guy that's got good software that does great editing. But our particular sheriff, if it, in fact, he'll edit anything that's personal, but our particular sheriff believes that every person in our county should have a concealed weapon permit. Because the evidence is, is that crime goes down when citizenry is armed. It's a proven fact. And there is a big pushback by the liberals and the pacifists saying, you know, it just begets gun violence. Well, let me, let's go to the scripture and let's see what God has to say about that, okay? So we can edit that part out and now we're going to come to verse 2. Look with me at verse 2. That'll make it easy, easier editing. Verse 2. If a thief be found breaking up or breaking in, and the idea is we're going to see in a few moments is at night. You're asleep. In fact, did you know for the first 15 seconds when you are awakened, you are considered clinically insane? Did you know that? Look at some of you when you wake up. <laughs> Wives, look at your husband. <laughs> like the lights are on, but nobody's home. Amy's trying not to nod her head because she's afraid I will 
rat her out to Bubba. No, listen, you are clinically insane for the first 15 seconds. You're unaware of your environment. And the idea is somebody breaks into your home at night and he is smitten so that he dies. You shoot him dead. There shall no blood be shed for him. You are innocent in the matter. And one of our laws of self-defense is based upon this law of God. If you are in a situation where your life is endangered, you have the right to defend yourself. We're going to see in a few moments in the Scripture, but you're only to defend yourself to the level of the threat. You can't go beyond that. If you have an opportunity to subdue that person without killing them, that's what you should do. But if you're walking out of your sleep and somebody's in your home and you don't know what's going on and you, and you, you, you dial quickly the safe that's next to you, flip it open and get your gun, and all of a sudden this guy appears in your bedroom and you shoot him dead, that is not murder. That is self-defense, self-defense and you go free. No blood will be required. God will not require any blood at your hand because that man had no business in your home, which is your sanctuary, especially at night when you first woke up and you're a little bit out of it so that you couldn't just subdue him without killing him. You are innocent. That's the idea here in the 22nd chapter, the second verse of Exodus. Now watch what he says here in verse 3. But if the sun is risen up, You're fully aware, you're fully awake, you see things, you can form a strategy maybe to subdue him or maybe to get out of the house and call the police or whatever. If there's a way to deal with the situation without taking his life, then then the idea is you should do that. If the sun has risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he shall not make full restitution if he hath nothing therein to be sold as a thief. Now, it kind of goes into another idea here, but the idea is, is that if he it's in the daytime, let's say you're sitting you know, in your house and all of a sudden you see a guy crawl through the window. He thought you were gone. And there you are, sitting in your house reading your Bible. You don't get to type the safe number, flip it open, grab your gun, and shoot him dead. You don't get to do that, Jeff. Mike, you don't get to do that. You can use as much force as necessary to subdue him. Now, if he comes in there and he pulls out a gun, and you can type the numbers on your safe really fast, and it's the old West, it's the quicker draw, and you take his life, like you guys have safes, I know, we can edit this. Um, (laughs) Then you go free. You understand? It's self-defense. You, under God's law, here's what I'm going to say tonight, have a right. In fact, I would say, and so is the sheriff in our town, you have a responsibility to protect you and your family. God has given that to you. That person has no business breaking into your home. But you're only to use force necessary to the level that is necessary to protect yourself. Understand that, guys? I think this is a very important teaching for our church. You need to do that. And then he closed up by saying, listen, for he should make full restitution. Now, you want to leave him alive so he can pay back what he's done. If he hath nothing, then he shall be sold. Here's that idea. He sold now the thief into the debtor's prison till he pays back what he owes. If a thief be certainly found in his hand alive, whatever he stolen is in his hand, whether it be an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall restore double. You found the thing, you caught him right there, you still have your animal. It's never left your property. But he had an intent to steal it. So you found it, your, your, your property is okay, but he still has to pay it back twofold. So he's got to come up. So not only did he not get your sheep, he owes you two more, so he's got to go earn that somewhere. And I think we'll just close off. Well, let's do one more. Let's just do verse uh, 5. I think this is important, and I, well, we have application. Some of you know that, uh, and God blessed it uh, a little while ago, maybe a year or so ago, that a guy was burning some trash over here in this field by our church, and it got away from him. 
and it came across the field because it was a windy day and it, the pond that we own out here that has those big pine trees around it, he burned them up. And I mean, flame was leaping. Donna was here, some people here. I mean, it would look like the church was on fire. And so they called, uh, because it was a forest fire and we were in the county, uh, they called uh, Washington Ridge where they have those uh, prisoners up there that come and fight fires and they came down and put it out. Now, he's responsible for that. But the beauty of that was is that because they came down here, we were able to negotiate for us to get back in the ridge and have Bible studies there. So God burned down a few trees to open a few hearts and it worked out really well. But here's what the law is on that. If a man shall cause a field or vineyard to be eaten or shall put his beast and shall feed in another man's field or the best of his own field and the best of his own vineyard shall make restitution. If a fire break out and catch in thorns, that's what happened over here, that, you know, so that uh, the stacks of corn and the standing corn of the field be consumed therein, he that kindled the fire shall surely make restitution. What is the idea behind God's law? You are responsible for your actions. If you let your beast get out and it gets into somebody else's pasture and eats the prime grass there, then you owe your neighbor your prime grass. You have to make restitution. If you're burning your trash and it gets away from you and it burns down your neighbor's house, you're responsible for that. So the idea of the laws of restitution were to govern people and make them responsible for their own actions. Amen? And you are responsible for your own actions, correct? It's like, and I'll just end with this joke, it's like the guy that came to the men's, I just thought of this. He went to a men's Bible study and the Bible study was on being the leader of your home. You need to be a man in authority. You need to be a man who leads your family. You need to be a man that, that is, you know, leading and you need to be in control. And that's what the Bible said he was on. And so the guy goes home and his wife says, honey, what did you learn tonight in the men's Bible study? Well, I learned that I'm the leader and you're supposed to do what I say. Now, he needs to be responsible for his actions, doesn't he? And someone asked him, well, how did that go? He said, well, I didn't see her for two weeks. The third week, I could see her a little bit out of one eye. <laughs> you are responsible for your actions. Amen. Be wise, because there can be consequences. Let's stand. Pastor Doug, will you come? So, you start a fire, you burn something down, it's on you. Amen. Father, thank you. And it is our prayer that the government that we are under would take heed to your word. We're told to pray for those men in leadership. And Father, if as strict and as harsh as it may seem, God's ways are right. They are right. And Father, your ways are the ways of order and peace. You, you don't say these things to harm and to hurt. In fact, it's the opposite. Because if we were to implement your judgments and your precepts into our culture, we could walk up and down the streets without any fear. We could live in unlocked homes and not worry. Your laws were brought into society and into civilization to bring peace and safety and security. You set men and magistrates, police officers and, and judges to be those who implement your laws so that society would be safe. Oh, how far we have strayed from that. But Lord, I pray that you'd bring us back. back to a civilization of order and peace. Place of security, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's kids would say, man, let's worship. Who 
breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in all in wonder the king of glory all this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cause You would lay down your life That I would be set free I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of Glory, the King of Glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun. All of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You would lay down. Father, as we're closing out our service, and you know, we have this coming Sunday, and then we enter into Resurrection Week, where we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And God, we want to take this opportunity to pray that you would just anoint our presentation, that every person who pulls into this parking lot and takes a tour there at the Last Supper who comes through and sees Christ being tried by Pilate, the crucifixion and the empty tomb, that it would impact their lives, Father. You know, we believe that time is short and that you're coming soon. And Lord, we want to be very faithful to be found preaching the gospel. And I can't think of a better way to invite this community to not only hear it, but see it. And so we pray that you would open their hearts to it. That we might be saved. They might be saved, Father. So we just lift that before you tonight. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless each person who came out this evening. Strengthen them. You know, may your spirit encourage them. 
May your word have an impact upon them. And you know, tonight what we can gather from this is that we are responsible for our actions. And there are consequences for every decision that we make and everything that we do. And we're going to be held accountable for those things. And so Father, help us to understand that that our behavior might be in accordance with your word. And we ask these things tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's kids that say, amen. Now listen, before you scatter, I got one more announcement. Next Wednesday night, we won't be teaching. It's our dress rehearsal. We invite you to come and take a tour. Because Wednesday is when we knock out all the bugs before we invite the community on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, correct? So come and don't be too big a critic. Be somewhat of a positive influence. And just come and take the tour next Wednesday night. Uh, well, well, let's have it at uh, what time you want to do it? Same time we normally have service, 6.30? 6.30 uh, next Wednesday night. This whole place will be turned into Jerusalem, AD 32. And uh, you'll get to be here. And so just come and take the tour. And then on uh, Sunday, this coming Sunday, after the service, we'll need some of you to stick around because we want to take down the chairs and get things ready for them to bring in the walls and start setting things up on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And so if you have nothing to do on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, please come down to church and help. Amen. See, Chris says, I guarantee she'll have a job for you. Correct? Okay. If you need prayer, we'll be up in front. If not, God bless you guys. You are dismissed.